ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Hello and welcome. I'm James Milan, and this is ACMI Producer Profiles, um, where we want to kind of shine a spotlight on our members who are also producing programs here. Um, there's a lot of different things that members do here in terms of learning video production and all its aspects, but some take uh, the helm and create their own programming, and we are very interested in sharing their stories with you um, so that you can gain inspiration, gain education and instruction about how it can be done, et cetera. Uh, and also because these people are just plain interesting. And we are starting with Yoftahe Gebru, who is uh, a, a origi originally from Ethiopia, but has been, he was just sharing with me here in the United States for longer than he uh, lived in Ethiopia, in fact. Um, and he is the producer of the Yoftahe Show. Um, which you're going to hear all about and which we want to delve into pretty deeply. Um, but also, um, he is a fascinating guy. So I'm just very glad uh, to be here with him. Yoftahe, thanks for coming into James. the studio, which, you, which is your studio too, <laughs> um, uh, to talk and to actually inaugurate this series, which um, uh, we're very excited about. Tell us a little bit about your journey to get here and specifically, you know, how did you move from, and initially, how did you move from your home in Ethiopia to the U.S.? What started this whole journey for you? Thank you, James. It's an honor to be here, and especially being in ACMI studio. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk more about that. So my name is Yoftahe, originally from Ethiopia and East Africa. <clears throat> so the journey started uh, with a surprise, let me call it. My mom worked for the U.N., so she was traveling between the U.S. and New York mainly. And then once I finished uh, high school, I was a first year college student. And then she came in and said, hey, your I-20 has been approved. You're going to America. <laughs> I said, OK, so we started. Had you, had you thought about so that I, before? I learned French in school, so I was thinking of going to France to continue my education. Mm -hmm. So America was still always, you know, uh, from the outside world, America is this land, or we'll call it, of opportunities land that everybody wants to go in. But I never thought I'll be coming here for the education. I was taught I was going to be going to France. Mm -hmm. But that changed when my yeah, mom said. So it really was a surprise <laughs> and, and rather a, a quick. Yes. You had to get used to it pretty quickly well, is quickly. what you were saying, I think, right? Yes. And so that brought you here and to college. Um, and then I would expect that you, like many folks who come here from some, somewhere else and go to school, with the intent of going back um, home afterwards, uh, that might have been your intention as well at that time. That's not what happened. Tell us, tell us about that. That's exactly what it was. I thought I'm going to come to a four-year four year program or maybe master's, a little bit of a different things, and go back. But uh, in between, I ended up getting married <laughs> and having a child. And then that by itself changed the course. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I I have always been very interested in learning and being part of the military program, call it like the atmosphere that I enjoyed. So I ended up joining the U.S. Army. Is that after, right? Yeah, two years that I was here, maybe two and a half years. Wow. So, so that an Ethiopian became, citizen still at that time, yeah. obviously, um, joining the U.S. Army at the yeah. age of. I was 24, I think. Wow. Yeah. So again, yeah. very unusual um, kind of entry yes. into the army. How did it go? It went well. You know, uh, the biggest thing, just like you said, you mentioned about the age group, most of the kids who join are like 17, 18, mm -hmm. that age. 17, they have to have parental approval, but 18. So the military by itself, the basic training is supposed to turn you to make you really tough and change so many things. And it's by itself, it's a cultural uh, um, big change, shock mm -hmm. that it is. Right. They're, they're trying to instill yeah. you in that culture, culture as quickly as possible, right? Yes. Yeah. So that part was good. The biggest tough, and then we always talk about it, is that they are like sometimes me being 24 and then having a 17-year-old or 18-year-old with you. They are still in that process of really growing 
and dealing with that age group is the most difficult part than really the army itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so right. So in, that's in, that's really interesting. So yeah. in fact, your peers and just kind of figuring out how how what the dynamic was going to be like between you and, and your peers there. Mm -hmm. All taking orders from the same, yeah. you know, the same bosses, the same sergeants and lieutenants and captains, et cetera. Um, but nonetheless, having to figure out how to get along, right? Yeah. And so what was particularly challenging for you about that? I think challenging and at the same time rewarding, let me put it that way. Um, I'm the kind of person when we go to good, every two years I want to do something different. I don't want to be stagnant or just be comfortable uh, where I am because the only way growth comes when you push yourself. So I've always pushed myself mm. to learn something. And one of the things when I came to the US, I didn't speak English that well. So, and whenever you start speaking, uh, especially a lot of people points out to your accent, especially being in New England. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I joined the army, so many kids from all the states came in mm. and guess what I realized? Everyone had accent. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Only here in New England do we not have any access, right? So, right. <laughs> so it's like from North Carolina, from Texas, from all over came in. I said, oh, my accent doesn't really matter. It's just how I need to be able to express. So that helped me not only to have more confidence and then uh, be able to understand, but at the same time, the little English that I knew at that time almost disappeared when the drill sergeant comes yelling and screaming at <laughs> you. You are in that shock. So mm -hmm. that by itself helps you also not only to look deep, but being able to connect and then your true self comes within. Mm -hmm. And then there is a saying, you don't really, you may have an accent, but you don't think with an accent. Mm. So you focus more on your thinking and then the collaboration. The US Army is really a great place to learn, not only as an individual, but what you can do as a group. Mm -hmm. So that's where I really, you turn from an I to a we. Right. So the we part you learn because my mistake can damage, can make so many uh, things go wrong. But if you and I work together and everywhere that you go, you have a body system. Mm -hmm. You don't go anywhere unless you have a body with you. Even if, when you go talk to the drill sergeant, you cannot just go and talk to them by yourself. Mm. So that by itself started building. And then it showed me to the deep level how connected and similar we are on the outside. I may be black, you may be white. The color doesn't matter anymore. It's like, what mission are you in? What is your purpose? So that's what you take out of it. And then all of it becomes just superficial because none of it, the outside that you see, none of it matter. What's in your heart? What's your mission? What's your goal? What you are trying to accomplish? You get a lot of that. I got that more from my parents, but at the same time, that helped me uh, to become who I am. Mm -hmm. And another thing, just to take you back, uh, growing up in Ethiopia, mainly a lot of black people, but you're surrounded also from white or other people come in. You are never defined as a black person. Mm -hmm. You're more who your parents are, what's your education, what are you capable of. When you come to the U.S., when I first came to the U.S., that's when you first time you realize you're black. I said, oh, <laughs> so what is this thing that you have? Mm -hmm. So people group you into black, white, Spanish or whatever, and you feel like you have to fit in in that, and then you start developing, let me call it the wrong way of thinking or saying them versus us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then by going to the military, again, what it did, it broke all of down. Once you wore that uniform, you are one, you mm -hmm. are we, and it doesn't matter if you're black or white or from where you come. So that brought up, again, the culture that I grew up, and that was a good way for me because that's how I grew up. The US military brought it back, even though most of the society outside right. the military try to divide you and separate you and, and they want you to pick a, a group which I have never been and I'm never comfortable with that so that's the pros and cons that I was able to get out you know it's really it's so interesting to hear you talk about that because for most of us our only exposure to the military is the commercials that we see on television sometimes and those commercials seem kind of trite in the way that they are conveying that same message that the military is all about being one, one with others, working together. You you are absorbed into and you and you become part of a bigger thing. We we get that message, I think, and because so many of us will never have a direct experience with the military at all, 
uh, we kind of think, oh yeah, sure. But it sounds, you know, in a, in a way that doesn't sound like a commercial when you talk no. about it. It sounds like it really <clears throat> does function, at least for a lot of people, in that way and have that tremendous, tremendous impact uh, that that can have, especially at the age, like you said, that most yeah. people are there. There's that young, transformative time from moving from teenagerhood into young adulthood and getting that message so strongly that you are part of something else and you will be judged by what you can do and how you can contribute and not by these other things. That's, that, that, it does make it sound like, wow, that wouldn't it be is. a bad thing for most people to do. It, you're definitely right, James. Uh, because it breaks down, because one of the things, doesn't matter what education you have, what age you are, if you're a guy or a woman, it breaks all of that. And then the basic training is supposed to just almost, I mean, sometimes it doesn't look, when you say it, blend you in, mm -hmm. make you start to break it down and build you back again mm -hmm. so that you can function as one unit. Mm -hmm. Because one mistake, can destroy the whole mission. Mm -hmm. So by you, we, you, you watch my back, I watch you back. Mm -hmm. So I depend on you, you depend on me. That solidarity is depending on who or what you're able to accomplish. And it doesn't matter if you're black, white, or anything, what you're able to bring into the table, that's what keeps everyone safe. So that by, its par par by itself, it helps you to have that we mentality and then to grow what you can accomplish. And then there's always the saying, uh, as one person, which you can put it, but two people coming together, putting their head, you can accomplish so much uh, together. So you see that atmosphere. So I wanna kind of zoom forward a little bit to just before the pandemic, when you, uh, we were talking before we went on air and you were saying that that's when you, it, the, the idea came to you uh, to begin to interview people, which you, I know you did from your home with the tools that were available at that time. And so that's instructive for people in and of itself, I think. Um, but I'm wondering, did you have any, at that point, had you had any experience in, in the world of media and communications and, and you know, even theater for that, for that matter? Uh, such that you were drawing on that to start this project or, or what? Definitely. So my dad is a writer. So I grew up in a college in a theatrical hall. Even I did my first play when I was like 11 or 12. Oh, wow. So dad always have that interest. So the how to express ourselves and how we connect with people have always been something that I'm always very, very interested. Uh, when you see a theater and then you see the audience that is so captivated for that two, three hours, and then they live the whole outside world, and then they can connect by wearing a costume, you can become almost a different person. So during, because before COVID, everybody was becoming, uh, I have a lot of people will call me for, to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a lot of one-to-one -one and I said, what if I brought up all the questions together mm -hmm. and start doing the interview, I can reach multiple people and the tools were available, Zoom, Facebook, uh, Instagram that are available. If I use that, instead of doing a one-to-one -one communication, I can engage with more, with a wider audience. So that's how I started it and that journey blossom and I have done in the last three and a half, four years, over 400 people that I interviewed. And uh, it's been an amazing journey that I, instead of just giving, I received also so much, I learned so much. And through that, that passion has grown to where we are right now, mm -hmm. to wanting to bring it also in a studio, so. I can't believe it, 400, yeah. 400 <laughs> interviews. You know, I've been at this for 10 years and, and I'm, you know, I've got about half that, I think, or something. <laughs> uh, you have been a busy man. How on earth have you been able to do that while raising a family and uh, while holding a full-time job? Because frankly, you are just the kind of person that we would like to draw into ACMI, either as a member, as a producer, as an audience, you know, as the audience. We want to get to folks in your stage of life, but it seems that everybody is so very, very busy that we can't really, you know, ask that of them, uh, or we haven't successfully found a way. You have a secret sauce of some sort. <laughs> Please share that with us. I don't know if it's a secret, but we all have 24 hours. And for me, what's your passion? What are you, uh, <clears throat> when you have the Wi-Fi connection, 
there is no limitation. I could be traveling, I could be from home. And most people, let's say nighttime, I did most of my interviews in the evenings or weekends. Mm. And all you need is an hour. Out of that 24 hour, if people tell me out of the whole week, you don't have an hour to talk about what's really important, what can communicate, I really, I mean, I don't want to say, you know, for me, finding that hour was almost like an obligation mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. that's the only way we can connect. That's how uh, we are able to share the information. And then serving people is part of my, you know, my growth for me and the, how I connect. That's why I call the show, The Yoftahe Show, and it says connecting each dot, dot being people like you and I, and at the same time, dot being the resources. A lot of people were lost during COVID. What can we do? Navigating even, you know, the unemployment that came up, mm -hmm. the healthcare. A lot of people were not working. They were stuck at home. They didn't know how to communicate family, raising their kids. So I touched in, in so many areas, especially on mental health aspect of it. And also the resources that are available, how we can get to it. People really got attached to it. So that's why I brought in so many professionals to share their expertise and reach as many people as possible. So an hour a week, anybody we can find. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's inspiring. It really is because I love the idea that what was what what catalyzed this for you is the fact that people were coming to you with questions and like you said you were dealing with them one on one each person would leave that satisfied and getting some answers but that's only one person and really you know that behind that person uh, stand many others yes. um, who are you know in a similar situation or have similar questions and so leveraging the power of media to actually extend your message beyond the, the person who's right in front of you. I mean, obviously that's what we're doing here yeah. right now as well, but it's a great, and especially because your goal is to help, yes. right? Is to answer questions, to provide information that's useful, to, you know, just to give people a sense that from ex having experienced and listened to what they did, they are in a better situation leaving, you know, leaving from there. And that's what we try and do yes. here at ACMI in so many ways. So one thing I wanted to, I was wondering about is that I know that once we came back from the pandemic into the studio again, um, and you'd had some interaction with us uh, up to that point, of course, you, you kind of jumped on the opportunity, I noticed, um, to get back in here before other producers did, really. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, given that the success that you had um, in using the Facebook and, and, and Instagram, et cetera, to get the message out, and also the flexibility that that gives you, um, what is it that drew you into the studio? And this is, pay attention to this. <laughs> Look at the setting by itself. Having to sit down like this, when you are just, uh, when I was doing it from home, I'm the producer, the technical, everything else, and it, it limits you how to be creative. Mm. <clears throat> you and I, when we sit down and behind the show, there are so many people with That's the camera true. and everything else, and then you and I can focus mainly on the message that we want to provide. And then ACMI, it's family that I had before, and I saw how it was working. And when I came back, the warm welcome and everything else that we are able to do. And together we can accomplish so many programs in here. So having someone like you and being able to sit down like this by itself, that is like, it's a healing system by itself. It's a therapy by itself. Mm. And when we do the editing in the back, turning around, goofing around and asking, hey, I don't know how to do this. That by itself is people knew exactly what resources are available in ACMI. Everybody wants to be a member, <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're interacting with the interns. I'm going to be doing a program with the interns that's going to be able to bring in what life as an intern is at ACMI. That's going to be able to show so many interns out there that they cannot get anywhere else to be able to come in and get that kind of experience in here and be yeah. part of a family. Uh, so much to do. Let's let's just note that what what Yoftahi is talking about here is absolutely the case right now. We have three interns who are producing this show for us. Hail to you! Uh, there in the control room, and uh, we really do appreciate and have a thriving internship program because these guys are learning by doing this work itself. And so it's good for them, but it's real good, really good for us as well, and enhances and expands that sense of community that you that you were talking about. We don't have enough time, 
Uh, we've got about five minutes or so. I got to spend some time asking you about the Yoftahe show. How, tell us about it, uh, what the motivation is, et cetera, but also the fact that your audience is different from our usual audience okay. and you're accommodating that in very specific ways, please. So the Yoftahe show, and then I, like I said, I call it connecting each dot. The main focus of it is on mental health, the mental well-being, how we communicate with each other, how we interact. And I want to take that barrier down and break it down by saying, it doesn't matter you're black or white, how me as an immigrant coming into the US, how is it I'm part of Arlington, I'm part of the US. So first I have to bring in what I call, call it my people or whatever, to, to make them feel comfortable what it's like to live in Arlington, to live in the Massachusetts, to live in the US, that communication starts and I have a good relationship with the Cambridge police, for example. We have done so many several programs, how to interact with each other, because sometimes when you look at the uniform, you think like it's us versus them. So if you say what's the goal is, I want to defeat that us versus them. Mm. And by having that communication, feeling people like to ask that deep question that you're afraid to ask. I have one child with autism. So that autism community, people don't really understand. They feel like it's something fearful that you have to stay away. I want to bring it in the open. There is no taboo. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Let's ask the question and let's not hide our kids. And like I said, and then I work a lot with youth. Most of the time as parents, we have the tendency of telling our kids or this was to tell them what to do. But we don't stop to ask them, what do you want? What's your passion? And we have to adapt. So I have a program that's called Growing Dad and Growing Mom. It's, we have to grow because I cannot raise my child who is five years old when he's 20. I have to grow with him. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to not connect anymore. So with all of that, at the end of the day, people are people. And I mentioned to you earlier, let's say if, you, if I needed a transplant, if you are the best match for me, doesn't matter you're white, black or green, doesn't matter because at the cellular level, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to say, let's talk, let's have deep communication about that. And any question that is not asked, that's what's hurting us. Mm -hmm. Because we like it or not, everybody's asking those things, but we never interact. So we don't have to be afraid of the other that's become us, just like the army that I talked about, the we part exists in us, mm -hmm. the deep down connection that we have that can help us to grow. So the Yof Tahi shows about welcoming those tough communication, communication that we have, and by having them, we can break down the barriers and get elevated into the next quad I call, and then people think like we are people having a spiritual uh, experience, but I feel like we are a spiritual human being having a human experience. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Therefore, I want to bring that spiritual connection with all of us, ask me any question, then we can be at the same level. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it all in a mark, I believe, are you not? I'm doing, I'm almost 70% in Amharic and 30% in, in English, yeah. Um, so talk about that. I mean, there's challenges to that. This is the, the language of, of, Ethiopia. of, your, of Ethiopia. Yeah. Like, is it, the, is it the single language? Is it a dialect? Oh, no, we is have it... almost like 80 uh, ethnic group, I mean, uh, languages, but Amharic happens to be one of the main languages spoken, ones, dominant uh, or... spoken. There are other languages also that are high, uh, but uh, that's the only one I speak uh, from Ethiopia. I speak also French, but in Ethiopia is one of the languages that I speak, and then mainly has been the working language for many years in Ethiopia, so a lot of people right. do so speak it. Right, so you know that if you are if you are broadcasting in that language, you are going to be able to reach a broad, a broad audience, audience yeah. um, in Ethiopia. So how does that actually work, though? How do, how, how do you do that? Do you, do you when you say it's 70% in um, Amharic and 30% and, uh, in English, how is that working? Are you using subtitles for the rest of the for the audience when it's in the other language, or that's the goal? You know, putting a subtitle is really a very difficult process through mm. the editing mm. part. So we didn't get there yet. Right now, we're doing it plainly in Amharic. But when I do it in English, the two programs that I just posted are completely in English. We did one on the youth, uh, all in English, and then we did a community. I had an interview. I brought in a chief police and then an assistant DA mm -hmm. that came in and talked about how to be part of the system. So that's another thing, completely in English. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that will be done in English that are gonna be able to help the, call it the diaspora or the people who live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In Massachusetts alone, we are, Ethiopians, we are like close to 20 to 30,000 between wow. that. 
Wow. So there are a wider audience that we're going to be able to reach between Malden, Cambridge, and some in Arlington, uh, but mainly between in the Boston area, we mm -hmm. do have a lot of Ethiopian communities. So, and especially reaching the youth. Most of them, they don't even speak, unfortunately, the Ethiopian language, mm -hmm. they speak more English. Mm -hmm. So that English part is going to have to be part of the program that we have to do. And then down the road, if the technology allows it, it's being able to add as many subtitles in English. Right, that totally makes sense. But for now, I mean, the, the actual audience that you can uh, reach here in the, in the Boston area and in Massachusetts is significant enough so that continuing to do the programming as you are right now, Correct. largely in a language that is comfortable for everybody to, to, to take this, in, this information in, uh, is gonna, that's gonna be a good working model going forward for a while, sounds like. Um, all right, we are officially out of time, but we, we always we always put in a little buffer, you know, so so that uh, you know I can we can wrap things up. I have to say, Yoftahe, um, I was really looking forward to the conversation. I knew that it would be absolutely, you know, just chock a block for for a half an hour, and that's what happened. We may just need to continue this conversation um, in the future, uh, but it's been uh, an you know, you said before it's an honor for you. It's an honor for me, uh, really. You are accomplishing really a lot um, in your life and with some profound uh, values at the core of what you're doing um, that we both support and we hope we reflect um, here at ACMI. But um, it's a pleasure to talk to you. It's a pleasure to work with you. And I look forward to more such collaborations in the future for sure. Thank you, James. I appreciate everything that you do. Pretty much you do the connection. Uh, we all go. You're personally going through things. I'm going through things. But we find the time and said we have to give in. We have to serve. And I really appreciate everything that you do. You always do it with a smile. Hmm. Whenever you connect here, you have that. I can see deep down. I feel like I can connect. So I really appreciate. And ACMI is a great home for a lot of us to be. Sometimes people that and do, they don't take advantage of all the resources that we have in here between the internship and the stuff that we have here, like Jeff, like uh, K K Katie, so many people that I can mention in here mm -hmm. that it is really a home people can come in and learn so much. There was a program that was done on kids with autism. That day was really a joyful thing. So this place does, we may see a little bit of a studio sometimes, but there are so much, so much thing that can be done, so much life in here. So I really appreciate that you took the time to do the interview, and I feel honored, like I said once again, to continue this conversation and uh, go deep down at a cellular level to be <laughs> able to connect more. All right. Well, a great start to our producer profile series. Thank you so much. Um, I have been speaking with Yoftahe Gebru, who is the host of the Yoftahe Show, Connecting the Dots. I will remember that that's an important subtitle. Um, and we appreciate Yoftahe taking the time to be with us. As always, we appreciate you as well for being here. Thanks a lot. I'm James Milan. We will see you next time.